Good evening. Welcome to our service of worship here in Strandmillis Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining with us online. We're going to begin worshiping God as we sing his praise in this very well-known hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Prince of Glory Died. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we can approach you this evening in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. As we come into your presence, we want to stop and just reflect for a moment on who you are. You are a great and wonderful God, exalted in the heavens, far above all your creation. You are a perfect God, perfect in your being, in everything that you are, and you're perfect in all that you do. You're a pure God, one whose eyes are too pure even to look upon iniquity, one who is of himself light, purity, and goodness. But we thank you most of all this evening that you are a wise God, that in you are all the treasures of wisdom, that your ways are, are different than ours, past our finding out, that you are just infinitely wise. We praise you for this, our God. We see it in our lives. As we look back on your providence, often we find it hard as we are going through times, but when we look back on them, we see your, your goodness and your wisdom how you've been moulding and shaping and changing us, even through the difficulties in our lives. We see your wisdom in this world as we look about it and see everything in its place, perfectly designed, all with a purpose. 
But most of all, as we have just been singing about, we see your wisdom at the cross when we survey the the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Well, our God, our hearts are filled with thankfulness for your wise plan of salvation. For we confess to you that we are sinners. We have sinned against you every single day of our existence. From the womb of our mothers, we have sinned against you. And yet, in the gospel, you hold out to us your wise plan of salvation, sending your Son into this world, pouring out your Spirit on our lives so that we would see his work, see our sinfulness, and cling by faith to him. And with the Apostle Paul, we say, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your ways. How inscrutable is your mind. You are wise. And we cling tonight to your wisdom in Christ. And as we come to your word, we confess to you that though it is your wisdom that so often the natural man in us only sees it as foolishness. That's what the world sees, that your word is just foolish. And so often we come to it And we approach it like the world and it's folly to us. And we confess that to you. And we pray that now by faith we would see in your word the wisdom of God. That your spirit would come and take it and apply it and use it to make us more like Jesus. Help us to behold wonderful things in your word and to be glad, our God. And as we pray for wisdom, as we come to your word, we pray for wisdom for many in our congregation in their lives. Some are going through tough trials and difficult circumstances, and we pray for them. We pray that you would bless them and be with them, that they would know your closeness and nearness, and particularly, Lord, as they get to the end of themselves, that they would call to you for wisdom. And haven't you said in your word that if anyone lacks wisdom, we can come to you, the giving God who gives without reproach. Please, our God, may that be true for them. Those who are struggling with loneliness or isolation or tiredness or feeling overwhelmed by work and family commitments. Those who are just finding life has got on top of them. Those who are struggling with grief or the end of a relationship. Please, Father, be with them. And as we pray for those, we thank you for your wisdom and your good plan that has been seen in the life of our congregation and many happy things this week. And we particularly rejoice with those who are welcoming the arrival of little children or grandchildren. And with them, we rejoice and we thank you for your grace. So, our Father, help us now as we come to your word. Surround us with your spirit. And may we know the wisdom of God as we see it in the pages of Scripture. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's turn together in our Bibles. Now we're going to read from 1 Kings chapter 17. We're coming back to our studies in the life of Elijah. 1 Kings 17. We're going to read verses 8 to 16. And if you want to put some sort of marker there, your finger, your thumb, your bookmark, and turn over then to the New Testament and come with me to Luke chapter 4. We're going to read some verses from the ministry of our Saviour. So 1 Kings 17, first of all, and verses 8 to 16. Let us hear the word of God. Then the word of the Lord came to him, that is Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward make something for yourself and your son. 
For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Amen. And then we turn in the New Testament to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to read at verse 16. That Jesus has begun his ministry and now he's returned to his hometown of Nazareth. And here we find him on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And let's read these words. Luke 4 and verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Well, we're turning back to our study in the life of Elijah this evening. Hopefully you remember that last week we began that study and uh, we introduced him as a character and the times that he lived in. You might remember last week that the theme of our sermon, and I said at the time that the theme of this chapter really is the word of God, God's word, the Bible. We saw how Israel had rejected God's word in favor of worshiping the Baal gods and how because of that, as God had promised in his word, as he had warned his people, God brought a drought and a famine on the land. But yet we saw how God's prophet Elijah was sustained and fed by his word as God commanded those ravens to feed him by the brook Kareth. Well, tonight we are continuing that theme. We're going to see in this well-known story of the widow of Zarephath the importance of believing and obeying the word of God. Nothing is more important in life than believing and obeying God's word. Our headings are very simple. Wherever, whatever, whenever. Wherever, whatever, whenever. That's what I want you to see from this chapter tonight. And I'll give you slightly fuller headings as we go. First of all, wherever. Wherever God sends, go. Wherever God sends you, go. We're looking here at verses 8 to 9 of chapter 17. Let's just think about Elijah for a moment. Last week we left him by the brook Kareth. Imagine how he felt as he waited. Now we're told in verse 7 that after a while the brook dried up. Every day he could see it getting lower and lower. 
God had told him to drink from its water, and every day he drank the remaining water. He could see it was drying out. Sure, he'd been praying for drought and famine on the land in accordance with God's word, as we thought about last week, Uh, but surely he was also praying for food and water at the same time for himself. And this was where God had told him to be, at the brook. And so he waits there at the brook. He's waiting for and on God's word. Right at the outset, there's a lesson for us there. God often makes us wait in life, doesn't he? We talk about it in our sermons. We quote to one another, Isaiah 40, verse 31, that those who wait on the Lord will be renewed in their strength. But when we actually come to a situation in life where we have got to wait, where we are by the brook, where it's drying out, where we can see the resources are ending, it is much, much harder. But wherever God sends you, go. And yet that lesson is going to become even more clear for Elijah in the next assignment that God has given to him. Look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath. Zarephath? Zarephath? We often picture Zarephath as this lovely little idyllic village with a kind-hearted widow at its gate waiting to greet Elijah, make him a cake. Come on in, Elijah. I'm going to feed you and sustain you during this time of famine. And of course, there's some truth there. But where is Zarephath? That's what the writer of 1 Kings is drawing our attention to. Look at what he says. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. It's in Sidon. Now, where is Sidon? Well, it's in godless Phoenicia. Where else have we heard of Sidon so far in this story? Come back. One chapter to chapter 16 and verse 31, which we read last week. And there we read that Ahab took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. She is from Sidon. It's her land. It's her territory. This is a godless land. This is a pagan place. This is Baal Central. This is where he is worshipped. It's the heart of godlessness in this country. And God is not only sending his prophet there, but did you hear the words of verse 9? And dwell there. God is calling Elijah to come to this godless, awful place. Now, why is God sending Elijah to Zarephath? Can I suggest three quick reasons to you? Firstly, God is showing his supremacy. He's showing his supremacy over the Baal gods. You see, this is Baal Central. This is where Baal is worshipped. And God is showing, I am the true God. I am the living God. We'll see this more fully in a few weeks, God willing, when we come to and arrive at Mount Carmel. But for now, I want you to see this, that God is showing his supremacy over the Baal gods. They were supposed to be the gods of rain, Much of their worship, as we thought about last week, was associated with cult prostitution. And so, uh, as part of that worship, the the rain was seen as a symbol that the gods were coming together in union. But there was no rain. And yet, the God of Israel was going to provide here in Zarephath. But not only is God showing his supremacy, God is extending. He's extending his grace. He's extending his grace to the Gentiles. You see, we thought last week of how Israel had rejected his word. And so we we saw that God removed it from them. But not only has God taken it from them, now he is giving it to someone else. Now he sends it to Zarephath, to Sidon, to, to Tyre and Sidon, if you like. There's an encouragement and a warning for us there. God sometimes does that. There's an encouragement. God is building his kingdom. Israel have rejected his word and his ways, and so he sends his prophet to the Gentiles. He is still building his kingdom, even in this time of national crisis. He is still at work in the world, 
As we will see, as we progress, this widow does not yet believe in God, but she will come to saving faith between this week and next week's sermons. And yet it's a warning too, isn't it? Here are God's covenant people who have rejected his covenant word. And not only has he removed his word from them as they have rejected him and his preaching, but he has given his word and his prophet to another land. That's why we read from Luke chapter 4. And there Jesus lives this out, if you like, because Elijah is simply a picture of his ministry to come. And Jesus is rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And as he is being rejected, as the people are amazed at his words, and yet, on the other hand, say, is this not Joseph's son? We've seen this boy grow up. We know this man. He's ordinary. There's nothing special about him. Jesus says, the prophet has no honor in his hometown. Just as there were many widows in the days of Elijah. But Elijah was only sent to the widow in Zarephath. Just as there were many lepers in the days of Elisha, but Elisha was only sent to Naaman the Syrian. So a people who reject God's word will have it removed from them and given to someone else. There is an encouragement. God is building his kingdom, but there is a warning. God is removing his word from one people and giving it to another. And so God is showing his supremacy. He is extending his grace. And God is developing. He is developing his prophet. He is stirring Elijah's faith here. Actually, Zarephath means the place of refining. A refinery. And that's what Elijah was going to find here. That his faith more precious than gold, as Peter puts it, was going to be refined. First it was the ravens, and now it's a widow. How humbling this was for the servant of God. First he had to rely on creatures who were dependent on the word of God. Now he has to rely on a widow who is dependent on the generosity of other people. He's being taught over and over and over again that the blessing it does not come from him, but that the blessing comes from God, that he is dependent on God for absolutely everything. Did you hear the, the repeat of verse 4? You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. In verse 9, go to Zarephath, behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Yes, the food comes from the ravens and from the widow, but ultimately the food comes from God. And this is what God is teaching his prophet. There was a video doing the rounds on some of the, the church WhatsApp groups this week, and maybe you saw it, someone sent it to me. Uh, and, it, and it was a lovely video that explained those truths of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, that our faith is more precious to God than gold, that he is refining it like precious gold. It was... Uh, telling the story of the process of metals, precious metals being refined. And uh, a lady had gone to a silversmith and asked him about this process. And he was explaining to her that uh, as the metal goes in, he never leaves the metal. He's always watching the metal in the furnace to know exactly the right moment to remove it. Because if he leaves it in there too long, it will get refined or it will get ruined. Not refined. And this is the comfort for us, dear Christians. Wherever God sends us, even if it's to the place of refining, even if it's to Zarephath, to the place of trial or testing or difficulty, God never leaves us. God is right there. God is watching over us. God will not let us be ruined. God instead will refine us. Maybe for you, going wherever God sends you doesn't mean getting up and going somewhere, but it means being in the place of trial or testing. Maybe for you, it means taking a step back in your career to care for loved ones who are sick and ill and need you, or to care for children 
Perhaps it's a sideways move to something that you just didn't expect. Maybe for you, it's reaching out to someone from a different cultural background, from a different side of the community here in Northern Ireland, someone who makes you feel uncomfortable. Go, for God is with you. Maybe for you, it means letting go of someone else, your children. Jim Elliot's parents didn't want to let him go, you know. He wanted to go to Ecuador, but as they looked around America, they saw lots of empty pulpits. They saw lots of spiritual need, and they wanted him to go and be an evangelist or a, a pastor somewhere safer in America. He wrote them this very moving letter. He said, I do not wonder that you were saddened at the word of my going to South America. This is nothing else than the Lord Jesus warned us of when he told the disciples that they must become so infatuated with the kingdom and following him that all other allegiances must become as though they were not. And he never excluded the family tie. In fact, those loves which we regard as closest, he told us must become as hate in comparison with our desires to uphold his cause. Grieve not then if your sons seem to desert you, but rejoice rather seeing the will of God done gladly. Remember how the psalmist described children? He said that they were a heritage from the Lord and that every man should be happy who has his quiver full of them. And what is a quiver full of but arrows? And what are arrows for but to shoot? So, with the strong arms of prayer, draw the bowstring back and let the arrows fly all of them, straight at the enemy's hosts. Wherever God sends you, go, go. But whatever, whatever, secondly, whatever God says, follow. Whatever God says, follow. We're looking here at verses 10 to 14. God's ways are so different from our ways, aren't they? And often God's word asks us to do things that seem to us counterintuitive, lacking sense. They feel and they look impossible. Why? Why does God act like that? Because God is in the business of glorifying himself. And that is what this widow is about to find out. Let's think about her for a moment. What is she like? Let's notice a few things about her. Well, she's a welcoming, polite lady. As Elijah sees her by the gate of Zarephath gathering some sticks, he needs to make sure that it's really her. Is this the widow that God has promised and told me about? And so he tests her. Verse 10, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And look at her, she's on her way. As she was going to bring it in. She's going to get him a drink. She's polite. She's welcoming. She's a lovely lady. But not only is she polite, but she's not yet a believer. She's a pagan at this point in time. Look at her response in verse 12. As she was going to bring it, Elijah called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. As the Lord, your God, lives. She knows a little about him. She knows the name of the Lord. But he's your God. He's not my God. I don't follow him. I follow the Baal gods, many gods. He's one out of a choice of many, and he's not my choice. He's your God, Elijah. And so she's polite. She's a pagan, and she is poor. She is really poor. In fact, the writer wants us to see just how poor she is. When Elijah takes it one step further and says, not only a drink of water, but can you bring me a morsel of bread? Well, she goes on to say, I've only got a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Sounds so hopeless, doesn't it? She's preparing 
her last meal for her and her son. They've eaten everything they have. They've watched it go down and down. There's nothing but a little handful of flour and a drop of oil left. A couple of sticks is enough to light the fire that will bake this tiny pancake. And then she's waiting to die. She's dying and hopeless. And at the end of her resources, she's poor. But God's grace is for poor people. God's grace, God's word is for people who are at the end of their resources. People who are dying and helpless. That's who God's grace is for. What does Elijah say to her? Look at verse 13. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Make me a cake first. What? Are you serious, Elijah? Did you not hear what I just said? You must be joking. You can't be real. Surely you heard what I just said. There's a handful of flour and a drop of oil, and you're asking me to make you a cake first, and then make me and my son a cake? It's risky. What he's asking her to do is risky. What if this promise doesn't come true? What if the flour and oil don't last as he is about to tell her? And it's costly. She's staking her life and the life of her son on what Elijah is saying. And maybe you feel a bit like this widow this evening. You're a polite, welcoming person. You're tolerant of others' faith. Sure, you're finding out a bit about Christianity. You know a little bit about the Bible, but it's one option among many. It's not your faith. It's not your religion. You know that one day you're going to die. Well, these last few weeks, as the coronavirus has been spreading, that lesson has been coming home to you a wee bit more forcefully. And as you've read the Bible, you can see what it's offering you. It's offering you life and blessing. Yet it sounds so counterintuitive. It's so difficult and hard to believe. You are really expecting me to believe that God will somehow count someone else's life lived 2,000 years ago as though it was my perfect life? You're honestly telling me to believe that Jesus, that man who, who died on a cross, that he was dying in the place of sinful people like me, And for you, it just feels too risky, too costly. You're staking your life on this. You're staking your eternity on this. It's going to cost you your friends, your family, perhaps. Don't you realize what you're asking? You're saying to me? Well, yes, I do. And what is it that Elijah can say to persuade this lady that she should follow his commands? Verse 14, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. God has said it. That's it. God has promised it. That's all I can offer you. But surely Elijah can do something more to demonstrate that this will come true. Can't he give her a little preview, a sneak peek of this miracle? Surely, she's a doubting lady, surely he can do something to help her believe. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And all I can say to you, if you are an unbeliever tonight, and you're doubting the claims of the Bible, is that God has promised. God has promised you stunning things if you will believe his word. He's promised to forgive your sins, to bring you into his family and give you a place of belonging and welcome. He's promised to you that you will be reconciled in your relationship with him, that you will now live life under his blessing and favor. He's promised you Christian brothers and sisters. He's promised you peace in your heart. He's promised you the presence of himself in the person of his Holy Spirit. He's promised you a future 
in heaven with him forever. But can I prove any of those things? Can I give you a sneak peek of those miracles? No. All I can tell you is that is what God's word says. And you must follow it. You must believe it. You must accept it by faith. And Christian, brother or sister, can I remind you that God's word often, often asks very difficult things of you and of me. But I want to encourage you that it never, ever leaves you without a promise. Here's Abraham. And he's waited so many years for Isaac, his son, to be born. And now God calls him to go to the mountain of Moriah and there to sacrifice his son. And his life seems to be turned upside down. It all feels so counterintuitive. We read about it in Hebrews 11 and verse 17 and 18. And there we read that by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. God was asking him to do something impossible. And yet, what was he trusting in? The promises of God. And he, that is Abraham, who had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. He was believing God's promise. He was following God's word, whatever it said, however impossible it seemed, however counterintuitive it made him feel. And God tells us, brothers and sisters, to go into all the world and to make disciples of every nation. It feels impossible. But he says, lo, I am with you always. And in his word, God tells us as believers to let not sin reign in our mortal bodies. And every day of our existence, as we battle against the old man within us, as we face familiar temptations that seem to get the better off us, it feels impossible. How are we going to do it? But God has given us a promise. For sin will have no dominion over you. The reign of sin, the dominating reign of sin is over in your life. God tells us to love one another from a pure heart. We find that so hard, don't we? To love one another, that's hard, but from a pure heart, from clear motives, not wanting anything in return. But God doesn't leave us without a promise since, he says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. God never leaves us without a promise, and he wants us to follow his word. He wants to encourage us that whatever he says, we must follow. George Muller, you know the story well probably. He was a minister who cared for many orphans throughout his life. 2,500 orphans were under his care towards the end of his life. And it was a faith-based ministry. He didn't have any debt. He didn't stock up on money. He simply trusted God every day to provide what was needed. Here's what he says. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Faith begins where there's a handful of flour and a drop of oil, where man's power ends. Faith begins where there's a brook with ravens and the water's drying up. And faith brings God glory. Whatever God says, follow. So wherever God sends, go. Whatever God says, follow. But thirdly, I want you to see, whenever God speaks, believe. Whenever God speaks, believe. And we're looking here at verses 14 to 16. 
how should we respond to the word of God? And, and how did this lady respond? Well, we've touched on it, but let's flesh it out in fuller detail. She needed to believe it. Verse 15, and she went and did as Elijah said. And we need to believe the word of God. Just think about this for a moment. The first time that she goes to make Elijah this cake, she's nervously using up this handful of flour and this drop of oil. She starts making the cake and then she turns back to see that the handful of flour is the same, that the drop of oil has not disappeared. There's still a little left. It's true what Elijah promised. But then tomorrow comes and she's got to do the same thing all over again. Every day, in fact, she's got to believe. Every day is an exercise of faith. Every day she's learning more about the power of the God of Israel. And it goes on for some time. We're told in verse 15 that she and he and her household ate for many days. The drought and the famine last for three and a half years. We're not sure when Elijah arrives in Zarephath within that time frame, but this goes on for many days. Some of those days, her faith probably doesn't feel so strong. And on some of those days, it's wavering. We've had a good run, but it can't keep on happening, can it? Why can't God fill up a few extra jars and put them on the shelf? Why doesn't God stack a few bags of flour in the corner of the room. Because God is strengthening her faith. Because God wants her to believe day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour. Because God is bringing himself glory. Every day is a new cause of thanksgiving to him. Because God is keeping Elijah humble, dependent, reliant on him and his promises and his word. You see, what was getting them through it was God's grace, as God had promised, received by faith. Verse 16, the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, as he spoke by Elijah. And that's what will get you through as well, dear believer. It's God's grace in his promise as you receive it by faith. And this widow had to believe every day that this miracle would happen. Just as Israel had to believe every day in the wilderness that the manna would fall from heaven. Just as we have to believe every day that God's promises of, of our salvation will come true. But often that's hard, isn't it? We find ourselves a bit like this lady with one problem piled on top of another. Her husband had died. Financial ruin had come. And now there was a famine in the land. And sometimes that's how we feel. It's just one thing after another. The road of God's providence has taken us to a dark, hard place. I'm done, we say. I can't go on. What do we do? Do you remember when you were a little child and you were out somewhere at night with mom or dad and it was dark and you felt afraid? What did you do? Didn't you grab on to their hand and squeeze it a little bit tighter? Didn't you hold on to them and listen for their voice? C.H. Spurgeon says, I would sooner walk in the dark and hold hard to a promise of my God than trust in the light of the brightest day that ever dawned. Hold hard, dear believer to God's promises. Hold hard to them. Learn them, know them, believe in them, think about them, trust in them. Pray them through that they will sink into your mind and into your heart, your will, your intellect, your emotions. Discuss them with others. Recite them to yourself. Believe in them. Believe in them. Whenever God speaks, 
believe. And that means we need to be coming to his word. We need to be people off the word, listening to it, hearing it every day, listening out for what God is saying, holding hard onto his hand. And it means we need to be people of faith, filled with his spirit begging and praying to him to help us believe. And when you're struggling, remember this. Your elder brother once hung upon a cross. And what sustained Jesus as he hung on Calvary's tree? Can I suggest that he was believing in the promises of God? even as he cried out that cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting from Psalm 22. He was speaking to himself, if you like, the words of Scripture as he was crying to his God. He was holding hard to his Father's hand. He was believing the promises of God. And so, wherever God sends you, go. Whatever God says, follow. And whenever God speaks, believe. Amen, and may God bless his word to our hearts. Well, we're going to sing now from a psalm, from Psalm 119, this this great psalm which speaks to us of the, the delight of God's word, of its power and its goodness. We're going to sing from the first part of that psalm, verses 1 to 8. And it's a wonderful section here introducing the psalm and reminding us of the supreme power of God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for joining with us this evening. Uh, We do look forward to joining together again on Wednesday evening at 8pm for our Bible study and prayer meeting. God bless and good evening.